So the most complicated fight in recent anime and manga history has now officially come to a close. Yes, that's right. It's official, ladies and gentlemen. We have a winner in chapter 235 of JJK. In the fated battle between Satoru Gojo and Ryomin Sukuna, we now have a victor. Yes, a fight almost 12 chapters in the making is done. And when you consider the fact that almost the entirety of the manga has been building up towards this moment, it definitely paid off. But just because the fight was long does not mean it was well explained. As even though the combat panels of this battle were incredible and seeing it animated is going to be an incredible event, this is one of the least understood battles in manga history. Now the reason that this is one of the least understood battles in manga history is because objectively this battle broke every rule that we learned from JJK up to this point. In fact, this battle was so complicated that in-universe characters were watching it and going, I didn't know we could do that. And this makes sense. The two strongest entities in the history of Jujutsu clashing against each other is gonna break a couple of rules. However, when it comes down to it, the breaking of all of those rules have left a lot of people scratching their head because figuring out what's going on in a fight in a manga is hard enough however when you have an already incredibly complicated power system having its already very complicated rules broken actively every single page it's gonna leave a lot of casual readers of the manga kind of baffled and therefore i've been reading and rereading this fight over and over and over again until eventually everything fit into this brain in a way that made sense and pretty much since the midway through this battle when i realized i didn't know what i was reading i decided to myself that when this battle was over i was gonna make a video breaking down exactly what happened in this battle how it happened and why it happened now it goes without saying that we're gonna be talking a lot of manga spoilers here so if you haven't read chapters 222 to 235 of the jjk manga this one's not for you. I'm not even gonna try to avoid manga spoilers here. It's impossible when describing a fight happening in the manga. But if you want a breakdown of how this battle went down and you want to hear who the victor is, then this is absolutely the video for you. So with no further ado, guys, let's get into Gojo vs. Sukuna Explained. But before we get into anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you want to hear me talking about anime without spoiling it, then you're going to love my anime podcast, Who Talk is Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you just want to enjoy some of the world's greatest anime merch ever created, go ahead and pop on over to my brand new merch store, otakusanonymous.net, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, stickers, sweatshirts ever created. This Mata Redonzo political team, very much included. So with the bringing of Chapter 2, 35, we now have a definitive ending to the battle between Gojo and Sukuna. At least it very much appears that way. As chapter 235 says that the result of the battle between the strongest has now been engraved in Shinjuku, and with the last panel of chapter 235, our winner is crowned. Now sure, in chapter 236, it could be like, just kidding, the fight is still going on. However, the resources, cursed energy, and healing ability of both of the parties in this battle have pretty much been exhausted. And also, the fight has been going on for 12 chapters now. For three months, Gojo and Sukuna have been battling. So not only does the story seem as though thematically that this battle is over, but also this battle's been running for a long time. Not that I'm complaining about that, the battle has been incredible. But the reason that we're making today's video isn't because this battle was incredible. It's because this battle was not only incredible, but also highly confusing. Now, if you're one of those people who understands JJK the first time you read it, congratulations, no one really cares. I mean, sure, you want to tell everybody constantly that JJK is not that complicated and that you understand it through one read. And you know what? Good job. Go get your Nobel laureate or something. But plenty of people struggle with understanding JJK, and I am one of them. Now, fortunately, JJK does make sense just after a couple of rereads. So I want to go step by step through this legendary battle with you and help you understand it, maybe myself understand a little bit better by saying it out loud how we came to the conclusion of having one victor in this battle. So let's start this video off in the way that we tend to start these videos off at the beginning. See, the fight opens with Gojo entering Shinjuku with Utahime and Yoshinobu. Yoshinobu, for those of you who don't remember, is the principal of the Kyoto High School, the old man with a rock guitar. Now, it's revealed to us that the reason that Gojo has brought Yoshinobu and Utahime is because of their abilities. Well, more specifically, the abilities of Utahime. See, Utahime has an ability known as Solo Forbidden Area. And Solo Forbidden Area allows Utahime, upon doing a ritualistic dance, to raise the cursed energy output of a selected individual to 120%. 
event. However, it's not just Utahima's premise that allows her to use Solar Forbidden Area. She needs to chant and dance and move and have music. And the music is why Yoshinobu is there. Once Gojo has his cursed energy amped to 120%, he opens the battle with a Hollow Purple. However, Hollow Purple, just like Utahime's Solar Forbidden Area, takes time to prepare and more importantly than anything, requires a chant. Now, this Hollow Purple is very obviously aimed at Tsukuna, who's four kilometers away from Gojo at this time. And this Hollow Purple hits Tsukuna because Tsukuna isn't able to react to it fast enough. Now, this isn't because of the speed of Hollow Purple. While Hollow Purple does travel somewhat instantaneously, the reason Hollow Purple hits Tsukuna is because Gojo brings a third person with him. And that third person is Ijichi, the assistant manager who opens up veils. Gojo doesn't trust anybody else on Earth as much as he trusts Ijichi. And thus, as Gojo is chanting to fire off his Hollow Purple, Ijichi raises a veil. Now, this veil is not only to make sure that people don't wander into Shinjuku, but also to act as a veil to mask Gojo's cursed energy output so Tsukuna won't be able to react to the Hollow Purple in time. And thus, because Ijichi's veil masks Gojo's cursed energy output, Gojo is able to hit Tsukuna with the Hollow Purple, which damages Tsukuna's hands, which he's able to heal almost immediately with reverse curse technique. After this, Gojo closes the distance between him and Tsukuna, and they spend about a half chapter battling it out with their fists and cutting buildings in half. That part's not complicated. They just duke it out and cut a bunch of buildings down. Gojo throws a couple buildings at Tsukuna. Tsukuna throws a couple buildings at Gojo. You get it. However, Tsukuna, upon cutting a building in half and throwing it at Gojo, closes the distance between him and Gojo and uses a technique known as domain amplification. Now, for those of you who have read the Shibuya incident, you'll know what domain amplification is, but I'll go over it briefly. See, domain amplification is like a simple domain. However, instead of spreading your domain in a small circle around you, domain amplification has you spreading your domain thinly across your entire body. And therefore, instead of wearing your domain like a bubble, you're wearing your domain like a suit. Now, amplifying your domain is a great way to nullify cursed techniques, as the domain that you're surrounding your body with is technically empty. And therefore, anything that your amplified domain comes into contact with will be absorbed by your empty domain and nullified. This is akin to punching with an empty fishbowl attached to your fist. As you come into contact with cursed energy, things will fill into this empty fishbowl and fill up that fishbowl, but scoop away from what you're attacking. And thus, by Sukuna amplifying his domain, he's able to nullify infinity, the application of the limitless that allows Gojo to not be touched by anything. However, there's a problem with domain amplification, and that is, while you're amplifying your domain, you cannot use your innate techniques. So, let's say, hypothetically, Gojo amplified his domain. Any cursed technique that he came into contact with would be nullified. While amplifying his domain, he wouldn't be able to use things like red or blue or purple. After this, they spend an entire chapter explaining how domain expansions work. And this is because the next couple of chapters are going to be real domain expansion heavy. Now, the only real important information that you didn't already know about domain expansions that comes out of this chapter comes from a conversation revolving around Mei Mei. Essentially, the topic of an open domain comes up, which in essence should be impossible, as a domain is a barrier technique, and therefore, by not applying a barrier to the end of your domain, what is your domain expansion? Now, as the majority of the people watching this fight have never seen Tsukuna's Malevolent Shrine, as the only people who knew what Tsukuna's Malevolent Shrine were were Yuji and Mahito, Choso chips in and states that open barriers are a possibility, as Kenjaku, in his battle against Yuki Tsukumo, used his domain, which is an open barrier type domain. Now, in this battle, Yuki nullified the guaranteed hit factor of this open barrier domain by using simple domain on herself. However, Choso and Meimei begin to hypothesize what would have happened if, hypothetically, Yuki had opened an open barrier domain on top of Kenjaku's. Because here's the thing, let me break this down in a way that makes sense. If you're battling against somebody and they open a domain expansion, you really have two options. If you have access to your own domain expansion, you yourself open a domain expansion and you enter into a battle of the domains. Or if you don't have a domain expansion, you apply a simple domain to yourself to nullify the sure hit factor of being in somebody else's domain expansion. However, in the battle of the domain expansion, the real battle is actually a barrier barrier battle. Thus, whosever barrier abilities are stronger overtakes the other person's domain. However, if two open type domain expansions were to clash, it wouldn't be a barrier battle of sorts. And thus, instead of two barriers clashing to try and nullify each other like a standard domain expansion battle works, it would instead be a battle for the outermost shell of the open barrier. That is to say, whosever range on the open barrier was strongest would win in the domain expansion battle. And thus, in actuality, it would be less of a battle between two domain expansions and more of a battle between two people 
peoples can't miss attacks. And therefore, the real struggle is in between barriers, but between the can't miss attacks. This isn't super important, so if you don't get it, it's not the end of the world. But a pretty good example of this point playing out in live time is Megami hopping into the captivating Skanda domain expansion and using Chimera Shadow Garden to nullify the guaranteed hit factor of captivating Skanda. And so long as Megami was able to hold on to a part of his domain expansion in this other domain expansion, even though his domain expansion is an open barrier type, he was able to attack the sure hit factor of Horizon of Captivating Skanda and therefore nullify it. So long story short, in a very simplistic manner, in a battle between open barrier types, the most important thing is the guaranteed hit factor. After having an entire chapter talking about domain expansions, guess what happens? Gojo and Tsukuna activate their domains and they enter into a domain battle, but in a domain battle, they're evenly matched. So they just continue their fight now in each other's domains. Now this is important because them battling in the domains is very different than them battling outside of their domains. See, because the activation of their domain expansion in the domain battle is already over. They tied, so both of their domains still exist. But now the key for either of them while battling inside of their domains is to injure the other badly enough that they have to drop their domain to heal themselves. In the second that the injured person drops their domain, the non-injured person's domain will take effect. So let's say hypothetically Gojo injures Sukuna and Sukuna gets so injured he has to drop Malevolent Shrine. He would then immediately be hit by Unlimited Void. However, unfortunately for Gojo, Sukuna's range on Malevolent Shrine is much larger than the barrier that he creates when using Unlimited Void. And thus, even though they tied in their domain expansion battle, Sukuna's range of Malevolent Shrine is actually able to attack Gojo's barrier of Unlimited Void from the outside. And if we learned anything from Megami being able to break into Horizon of Captivating Skanda, or Yuji being able to break into Mahito's domain expansion, we know that domain expansions are very weak from attacks from the outside. And thus, Sukuna, whose range once again extends beyond the barrier that Gojo's Unlimited Void created, uses his domain expansion innate techniques, cleave and dismantle, on the outside of this barrier and destroys it. And thus, Sukuna's domain expansion is the only one currently existing. So Gojo is attacked by Sukuna's cleave and dismantle, which inflicts hundreds of wounds on him instantaneously. And thus, Gojo has to focus on reverse curse technique to heal all of these wounds. Now, I know what a lot of you are probably saying, but how can these attacks hit Gojo in the first place? Shouldn't these attacks not affect Gojo because of his infinity? No, unfortunately not. Sure hit attacks within the capacity of a domain expansion override infinity, and thus any cleave or dismantle afflicted upon Gojo within Malevolent Shrine goes through infinity. Gojo then begins using Simple Domain to battle against the sure hit factor of Malevolent Shrine. And while he uses Simple Domain to make sure he's not getting sliced to smithereens, he stops using Reverse Curse Technique, or at least that's what everyone thinks. Because here's the thing, immediately after using Domain Expansion, your Curse Technique gets fried. See, the reason that a lot of people don't use the Domain Expansion right off the jump is because if you lose in a battle of Domain Expansions, you now no longer have access to Cursed Energy or your innate techniques, which makes you incredibly vulnerable. However, Gojo realized that he can use Reverse Curse Technique on the fried part of his brain that happens after using a Domain Expansion, which is something that nobody, even the people in Universe, knew you could do. So Gojo, just a couple of seconds after having his Domain Expansion broken, activates Domain Expansion once again. Gojo activates Domain Expansion after Sukuna increases the range of Malevolent Shrine to its maximum because it wasn't at its maximum yet. Also kind of an important side note here, the bigger the range on Malevolent Shrine, technically the weaker it is, at least curse energy output wise. I mean, you don't want to be affected by any of it, but if the range is 10 meters as opposed to its maximum 200 meters, it's much stronger within the capacity of those 10 meters. So Sukuna doesn't always open it to its 200 meter range immediately if it's not necessary. But Gojo baits him into increasing the range and activates his own domain to battle against that range increase. However, now Gojo has switched the properties of his own domain and has made the inside weak to attacks and the outside strong against attacks in order to make sure even if Sukuna's range is greater than that of his barrier, attacks from the outside won't allow for his domain to be broken as Gojo believes he'll be able to defend his barrier from the inside. And once again, they tie. So fisticuffs time. However, this time within the capacity of the domain, Sukuna amplifies his domain in the battle against Gojo, which is also not a thing that anybody knew was possible because they're currently battling in his domain. So the fact that he could amplify his domain around his body while in his domain was kind of crazy. And the reason that was scary is that because while they're in Sukuna's malevolent shrine, he's granted the abilities of cleave and dismantle, even when amplifying his domain. And considering what we know about domain amplification, 
nullification, this now means that Sukuna has the ability to punch through infinity and use his innate techniques, which is something he can't do outside of his domain. However, the reason that Sukuna amplifies his domain is kind of for a nefarious reason. See, Sukuna amplifies his domain so he can touch Gojo. Because Gojo's Unlimited Void works in kind of an interesting way. See, Gojo's Unlimited Void affects everybody within his barrier, except for those he's touching, which is why he was able to bring Yuji into his Unlimited Void in his battle against Jogo. And therefore, when Sukuna touches Gojo, he's no longer affected by Unlimited Void. And upon touching Gojo, Sukuna makes a binding vow with himself to state that Malevolent Shrines can't miss effect is actually nullified within Gojo's Barry. Now, usually that would be a death sentence because like we stated earlier, when battling against an open barrier domain type, it's not a battle between two barriers. It's a battle between the can't miss effect. Now, if your domain expansion abilities are equal, like they are for Gojo and Sukuna, your can't miss effects nullify each other. However, upon coming into contact with Gojo, Sukuna was no longer affected by the can't miss effect of Unlimited Void. And therefore in that moment, he was able to make a binding vow to state that his can't miss effect doesn't work within Gojo's domain. Because if Sukuna got rid of his can't miss effect prior to coming into contact with Gojo, he would have immediately been affected by Unlimited Void. But because Sukuna nerfed Malevolent Shrine so hard and took so much risk, Malevolent Shrine became much stronger, which not only increases Malevolent Shrine's range, but also makes its cursed energy output much higher. And therefore, Sukuna is once again able to attack the outside of Gojo's barrier and destroy it once again forcing Gojo to bear the burden of Malevolent Shrine, which now has its can't miss attacks back because Gojo's domain is not around. However, instead of using a simple domain this time around, Gojo uses a different technique, a technique called Falling Blossom Emotion, which is a technique only known to the big three families of Jujitsu. Now this technique is different from simple domain in that it doesn't completely nullify the effects of the can't miss. However, it allows you to bear the attacks of the domain expansion much better. And therefore all of the can't miss attacks launched at Gojo only leave shallow cuts. And in the time that Gojo gets upon the activation of this technique that causes all of Sukuna's attacks to only be surface deep, he once again uses reverse curse technique on the part of his brain that controls domain expansions and activates his third domain. However, this third domain is the largest one he's activated yet. And upon the activation of this domain, Gojo spreads his barrier beyond Sukuna's malevolent shrine range and then shrinks it very rapidly to a size smaller than a basketball. Now, Gojo has done this in order to capture all of malevolent and shrine within his barrier. Now, technically creating a barrier smaller than a basketball should be impossible because creating a barrier is all about having a concrete image in your mind. And you can't have a concrete image of both you and another person fitting within a basketball. However, because Gojo spent 12 days in the prison realm, which is about this big, the experience he gained by conceptualizing the fact that you can fit people in very small pocket dimensions allows him to condense his barriers down to an impossibly small size. However, Sukuna, upon realizing that Malevolent Shrine is now a foot across, massively decreases the range of Malevolent Shrine to increase its cursed energy output. And I'd like to make it clear to everybody that they're not fighting in a basketball-sized barrier. Barriers in domain expansions don't play by the rules of physics. This is why Horizon of Captivating Skanda is able to keep an entire tropical island in it, even though the barrier itself is five feet across. And because Sukuna was able to increase the cursed energy output of Malevolent Shrine, he is one once again, able to destroy Gojo's barrier. However, while Sukuna focuses on destroying the barrier, Gojo closes the distance between them and injures Sukuna. And because Sukuna has been injured so gravely by Gojo, he has to focus on healing himself, which causes Malevolent Shrine to dissipate. Now, all in all, it took Sukuna three minutes and nine seconds to destroy Gojo's barrier, which is important because Gojo and Sukuna opened their domains once again. This is the fourth time that Gojo has opened his domain. However, this time Gojo has figured out the plan for beating Sukuna. See, well, obviously in the battle of domains, they keep tied and therefore the can't hit effect to both of their domains is nullified. So now and only now can they have the battle in their domains that they were supposed to be having this entire time. You know, the battle where if one of them is injured gravely enough within the domains, their domain falls and the other domain takes over and affects the person who's been injured. And because Gojo was able to play with the attributes of 
remove his barrier, he was able to realize that he now has three minutes in nine seconds before Sukuna is able to destroy his barrier to injure Sukuna badly enough that Unlimited Void is able to take over and defect him and give Gojo the win. That is to say, Gojo has three minutes and nine seconds to hurt Sukuna. And when he hurts Sukuna, Sukuna will be hit by Unlimited Void and therefore will be forced to stand still as he processes the entire information of the universe. And in those couple of seconds that he's standing still, Gojo can kill him. And once again, after these three minutes, the barrier is destroyed, but Sukuna is hurt. Once again, they both activate their domains. However, it takes Sukuna 0.01 seconds longer to activate his domain than Gojo, as Sukuna has incurred more damage than Gojo, and therefore it takes him just a smidgen longer to activate his domain. And in that 0.01 second, Sukuna is hit by Unlimited Void, which stuns him for a second, which allows Gojo to close the distance and punch a hole in his chest. However, the battle in the domain expansion lasts for another 2 minutes and 40 seconds. But after 2 minutes and 40 seconds, Malevolent Shrine is destroyed, and once again, Sukuna is hit by Unlimited Void for less than 10 seconds. However, 10 seconds of Unlimited Void is enough to stun Sukuna long enough that Gojo should be able to kill him. However, before Gojo can close the distance to kill Sukuna, Maharaga is summoned, which gives Sukuna enough time to recover from being hit by Unlimited Void. Now, Maharaga is powerful, the most powerful out of all of the 10 shadows in the 10 shadows technique. And Maharaga's strength comes from a couple of different things. A positive cursed energy blade attached to Maharaga's sword is able to nullify all cursed techniques. Maharaga also can't be killed the same way twice, as Maharaga, upon being exercised by one technique, can come back immune to said technique. However, Maharaga doesn't have to die to be able to adapt to a technique, as if Maharaga is hit with the technique, it will begin to adapt to said technique. And then after being hit by that technique enough, Maharaga will be completely immune to that technique. But now usually the person who needs to be hit by this technique to become immune to it is Maharaga. However, after defeating Maharaga, Sukuna was able to take Maharaga's wheel. You know, the big spinny wheel attached to its back. And now Sukuna is able to either place this wheel above himself or others to make them bear the burden of adaptability. And Sukuna, using the Ten Shadows technique, was able to take this wheel and place it over Megami's soul, which means every single time that Sukuna was affected by Unlimited Void, it was actually Megami bearing the burden of adaptation for Maharaga. Let me explain that in a simpler way. Sukuna is obviously in Megami's body, right? But we all know that Megami's soul is still inside that body, and therefore anything technically that Sukuna is hit by, Megami is hit by, which means every single time that Sukuna was hit by Unlimited Void, so was Megami. However, Maharaga, who needed to be summoned, wasn't affected by Unlimited Void. But since Sukuna didn't want the big wheel above him, very clearly depicting that he was taking the burden of adaptability, he put the wheel inside of himself over Megami's soul, which means every time that he and Megami were hit by Unlimited Void, Megami was bearing the burden of adaptation for Maharaga, which means that upon Maharaga being summoned for the first time, Maharaga was invulnerable to Unlimited Void. Which means Unlimited Void now won't work against Maharaga. However, Gojo doesn't believe this and tries to open his domain once again, only to realize that the part of his brain that controls domains is fried. Fried beyond what reverse curse technique would be able to fix right now. And thus Gojo can't open a domain. And Sukuna laughs at him and goes to open his own domain. However, because Sukuna had been hit by Unlimited Void for around 10 seconds, his brain had taken so much damage, he also could not open domains. So back to fisticuffs. However, Sukuna sends Maharaga back to the Shadows Dimension. Because Maharaga, while very powerful, is not immune to Gojo's infinity. And Maharaga doesn't know domain amplification, so in a battle against Gojo, Maharaga was gonna lose. At which point, Sukuna takes the wheel and places it above himself. You see, because in this battle of fisticuffs, Sukuna is going to bear the burden of adapting to infinity. Meaning that every single time that Gojo strikes him, while infinity is still active, Sukuna will adapt to infinity in place of Maharaga. And therefore, every single time that Gojo lands a meaningful blow against Sukuna in this battle of fists, he's teaching Maharaga one step at a time, it takes four to five times, how to be completely immune to Gojo's invulnerability. And eventually, Sukuna is able to adapt to Gojo's infinity, meaning that Maharaga is now no longer affected by infinity and can punch through it. So after a brief chapter-long battle with their fists, once again, Sukuna summons 
Maharaga. However, since Maharaga is now completely unaffected by infinity, it goes on the offensive, while Sukuna tries to make openings for it so it can take Gojo out. Gojo, understanding that Maharaga is now adapted to invulnerability, tricks Sukuna and Maharaga into believing that he's only going to use his infinity and Azur, also known as Blue. Which feels important to cover right now, actually, for a little bit. Azur, also known as Blue, also known as Curse Technique Lapse Blue, is how Gojo not only travels instantaneously, that is to say, tele Teleports, but also how Gojo is able to control attractive forces. Because one of the applications of the Limitless is that Gojo is able to make imaginary negative mass. And the universe not wanting negative mass takes all of the mass around that negative mass and launches it at it, essentially making kind of a black hole. And because of this, Gojo is able to use his technique on himself to attract himself to other spaces, which makes him teleport instantaneously. He doesn't actually teleport, he just moves really fast. However, upon making Maharaga and Sukuna believe that he's only going to use his infinity and blue, he fires a red behind Sukuna that Sukuna doesn't see that laps around an entire curved building and comes back and strikes Sukuna in the back. And upon Sukuna being struck with this red and obviously being surprised, Gojo cocks his fist and strikes him with a black flash. Before Gojo can finish the job, Maharaga steps in. And Maharaga, who's adapted to infinity, starts battling against Gojo on equal footing. But just having one crutch isn't enough for Fraudkuna, as in order to make sure that Tsukuna has enough time to recover from the black flash, he also summons something known as Ajito. Now, Ajito is a chimera of multiple different shadows from the Ten Shadows technique, with Nue and Max Elephant and Round Deer all incorporated into Ajito. Now, the real problem out of all of those components added into this chimera is is Round Deer, as Round Deer is constantly emitting positive cursed energy. And therefore, as long as Ajito exists on this battlefield, not only will it be able to nullify cursed techniques, but also heal Sukuna. And just like that, a 3v1 battle has begun. Gojo realizes that he has to kill Ajito, first and foremost. However, while he's in the process of trying to pull this off, Maharaga slices off one of his arms. And when things are looking real grim for Gojo, he snags Ajito and says, you just can't really keep up with the rest of us, throws Ajito and fires a Maximum Blue into its chest. Maximum Blue obviously being an incredibly strong gravitational pull that completely deletes the Chimera. Gojo then grabs Sukuna and throws him into Maharaga and begins to start the chant for firing a Reverse Curse Technique Red into their chest. However, Gojo's not actually aiming at Maharaga and Sukuna. He fires beyond them. In actuality, he's aiming at the Blue that is still active as a gravity well, crushing Ajito. Sukuna, realizing what Gojo is going for, orders Maharaga to stop the red. But before Maharaga can get to the red, Gojo teleports in front of him using his blue. However, while Gojo is battling against Maharaga, who's trying to destroy the red that's heading towards the blue, Sukuna uses a piercing blood technique and fires it at the red. And as the piercing blood is hurtling towards the red, and mind you, if it makes contact with the red, it'll activate the red's explosion, and there goes your purple, Gojo says an incantation that increases the power of the maximum output blue. And thus, the piercing blood that is hurtling towards the red is pulled into the blue. Now, since the entire idea of blue is to pull things into it and crush them, piercing blood does not destroy the blue. And thus, as Gojo has stopped Maharaga and the piercing blood, the red and the blue collide, creating hollow purple. See, I'll quickly go over how Gojo's abilities work here so you can understand what red and blue and purple all are. See, blue is the creation of negative distance or negative mass. Like we've already said, the universe doesn't think that negative mass should exist, and therefore all the positive mass goes towards that and creates a giant gravity well. Red, on the other hand, works in positive numbers. It's kind of just an energy beam. It pushes and destroys anything in front of it. However, when you combined both red and blue, what happens is the positive energy of red pushes the negative energy of blue in a combination, which creates a beam of negative energy that absorbs and destroys anything it touches and is also able to be fired long distances. However, it's usually fired. But this purple wasn't fired, it reacted. And thus, instead of being fired away from Gojo, it exploded in a bomb that basically deletes the entirety of Shinjuku. However, because it's not being fired away from Gojo, but instead exploding where Gojo is, this purple affects Gojo. But because it's Gojo's cursed energy, it affects him less 
than Sukuna. See, not only does his purple completely delete Maharaga, it gravely injures Sukuna, who now has no ability to open a domain, no Maharaga, no Ajito, no reverse curse technique, no ability to beat Gojo with domain amplification, no bitches, no family, no money, no life, no win. And it now appears in chapter 235, we have a winner in the long, drawn out battle between Gojo and Sukuna. And that winner is the honored one. Now, are Sukuna or Kenjaku gonna pull out some tomfoolery and probably make this fight go longer and cause Gojo to lose? Probably. But as it currently appears in a one on one battle between Gojo and Sukuna, Gojo is won, which means that the rest of the manga will be dedicated to everybody but Gojo battling against Kenjaku. And honestly, considering the fact that Gojo was able to tie together two black flashes, which was able to kickstart his reverse curse technique, Gojo will also probably be involved in future battles. As the real reason that Gojo is being declared the winner over Sukuna right now is the fact that the black flashes kickstarted his reverse curse technique. So when it comes to his ability to heal his body or the parts of his brain that control his cursed energy, he is way further ahead than Sukuna, making Sukuna kind of a non-factor to him at this point in time. So yes, Gojo is one, which quite honestly, I did not expect. I figured for sure somebody else was going to have to step in in the battle against Sukuna. And while that might still happen, I think it's crazy that we got a pure 1v1 in anime or manga. But what did you guys think of the fight? Did this video help you understand it at all and therefore appreciate it more? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. I just know Kenjaku's gonna do some absolute tomfoolery.